No. Nobody tried to help us. It definitely took my face away when I saw innocent people being killed, especially when the little children were taken away. Because you see, again, when we were leaving the ghetto, anybody under 12, anybody over 50 had to remain behind. Three and a half weeks. And by that time, we were ready to be sent to the gas chambers. So they didn't want to let us go. They kept telling Oscar Schindler, the, the women, they are old, work, they are old. We'll send you fresh ones. And uh, Oscar Schindler said, those are trained workers and I want them. So if, if you saw the movie, everything in that movie is true. I see it happening again, and I think we cannot allow this to happen. Well, I, am, um, I was born in Krakow in Poland and I lived there for the first 10 years of my life. Um, a very happy, wonderful uh, life because um, um, I am an only child where my father was one of eight siblings and my mom was one of seven siblings. So I had a lot of aunts and uncles and little cousins. and. Um, Life was uh, wonderful. Uh, I was always aware that being a Jew in Poland, uh, we didn't have the same privilege as the Polish people. But um, uh, being little, uh, it didn't bother me that much because it was not personal. I didn't come across it. It was what I heard, what I knew, but it didn't happen to me. So. You don't pay much attention to politics when you are a young kid. There was always talk about anti-Semitism in Poland, and I was really always aware of it. I listened sometimes to when my parents talked about pogroms. They were telling me the story of pogroms. I remember there was a, um, there was a poem I learned about the pogroms. And, uh, but still it wasn't personal. It didn't touch me yet. I was too young to understand. What did your parents do for a living? My mom was a stay-at-home mom, and my dad was a sales representative for a company very much like uh, Johnson & Johnson in Poland. So he traveled a lot, and um, we lived in a beautiful apartment building. We had a beautiful apartment. Krakow is a beautiful city, very ancient city. So we lived right next to a Wawel, which is an ancient castle. And uh, right across the river, Vistula, one of the biggest rivers in Poland. Uh, I went to school around the corner from my house. My maternal grandparents lived around the other corner of my house. And um, I, I think about it now that I don't ever remember have my parents really having friends. Um, and there is nobody to ask now because there was always family. You know, holidays were spent with the family, vacations were spent with aunts and uncles and cousins, and it was a lot of fun. I never had any non-Jewish friends. Uh, till I went to school, when I went to first grade, I remember playing, and I went to the school around the corner from my house, so my mom could see me at uh, recess, playing <laughs> in the schoolyard from the back, the, the back of her, uh, the apartment from the balcony, and um, there were very few. There was a public school, all girls' school. All the public schools were, you know, the, they were either girls or boys, separate, of course. And um, I remember one of the little girls uh, yelled at me while we played uh, hopscotch, and she said, "You dirty Jew!" And she threw a stone at me, and I remember I was shocked. 
I came home and I said to my mom, how could she come dirty? I took a shower this morning. And then I remember try to explain things to me about the anti-Semitism. Uh, the Polish people, a lot of the farmers, uh, the people that didn't know how to read and write, and they went to the church every Sunday and they were told um, that uh, the Jews killed Christ and watch out for the Jews. They can, uh, they kidnap your babies and they use the blood to make matzos. All this, uh, and they believed that. But uh, also there were uh, people that were intelligent, educated, and they still hated the Jews. No, nobody tried to help us. People didn't try to help us and the soldiers that guarded us I mean, there, was a, there were two entrances to the ghetto, heavily armed by the uh, Nazis, the SS, and uh, some Polish police and Ukrainian police. And their uh, the goal really was to kill as many people as they could, so that uh, you never knew when you went outside to work if you would come back because sometimes the soldiers came into the workshop. Obviously. All the people who had businesses before the war were taught to create workshops in the ghetto so that we would be slaves, we were slaves, uh, there would be free labor. So there was a workshop for the tailors, for the dressmakers, for the shoemakers, for the brushes and brooms. Uh, there was a place where they were fixing some Mostly men were working with some metal things, and I was working in a printing shop. So we worked double ships, I mean, we were swing ships, from six in the morning to six at night one week, and six in the, at night at six in the morning. And there were always guards around, so that the guards would come into the workshops and look at the people, and if they decided somebody was too slow or too old or too young, they would just take those people out. And um, there was a big uh, square in the ghetto, and they would gather all those people, and um, they would uh, t take them away. And we didn't know where they were going, because what the Germans were doing was not, you could not imagine that human be beings would be capable of doing, of murdering innocent people whose only crime was that they were Jewish. So you couldn't believe that the world would stand for it. No, it yeah. And um, it was very hard to believe. It's still very hard to believe now. Even though we are f now witnessing uh, horrible things, just like we did in 1936, 1937, uh, genocide is happening and has been all over the years and actually nobody is doing anything. Certainly United Nations is not doing anything. And uh, most of the people are being taught how to hate. In, in uh, the Arabs teach their children, they take little boys who are three, four years old and teach them how to kill the Jews. And, People who hate are deaf and blind. They only know how to hate. They don't know how to read, they don't know how to write. They only know how to kill. When you went through the liquidation of the ghettos, um, what, were kind of, what, what did you see during that time period? Well, I saw people being shot, beaten, Take families being uh, torn apart. Uh, by that time, my father has been taken away. My mother's uh, parents were taken away. My mom and I were taking care of my little cousin, Jenny. She was a um, daughter of my, um, one of my mother's sisters who was turned to Tarnov. And when Tarnov was being liquidated, my father was still with us. And I don't know how uh, he was able to get Jenny 
because she was blonde and blue-eyed. And so my mom and I were taking care of her, but um, when we had to go to work, she had to hide. There were many children in the ghetto that were hiding. And you know, they were so smart because they were so little, and they knew they had to be quiet. They couldn't cry. They couldn't run. They couldn't play. They had to be hiding when the adults were at work, and they were left alone. And most of the time they were hungry because we didn't have food and thirsty because in the ghetto the water was on only for a certain time. The electricity was on only for a certain time. And somehow, you know, Hitler wanted to have an Aryan race. Everybody blonde and blue eyed. And yet when you look at the pictures of Hitler, when you see his black hair and the black mustache, and he's surrounded by the generals, and surrounded by his so-called cabinet, none of them was really that blonde and blue-eyed. I think that Himmler was blonde, but he was also very fat. Everything that Hitler was against, and how could people, you know, look at Hitler and listen to him? Uh, but to me, with his black, uh, black eyes and black moustache, he looked more Jewish than any other Jews. So how could the world, how could he inspire millions of people to such a systematic, planned killing of innocent people? And how could the world stand by and not do anything about it? because it could have been prevented. Right. When the ghetto was liquidated, where did you go from there? Did you from the ghetto, we were sent to a concentration camp. They liquidated the ghetto, and we built a concentration camp about seven kilometers outside of Krakow. It was called Plashov. It was built on two or maybe three Jewish cemeteries. And you can imagine what happens to a cemetery when the ground is level. And the men were building the barracks. The women were supposed to build the road from the broken tombstone. Some of the tombstones were taken away. When some Polish people used it for their driveways or for the streets. And um, the commander of the camp was Amon Gert who was from Vienna, and we thought, wow, he's from Vienna, so he's going to be very cultured. You see, the only thing we knew about Germany or, we, or Austria was that it was a famous for its writers, composer, a very cultured state, we thought. We didn't expect those people to become w worse like animals killing innocent people without any feeling. And they looked at Jews and they said, you are, they, they're not human, they are inhuman. They were worse than cockroaches and they were worse than rats. The propaganda against the Jewish people by uh, Rosenberg was vicious. And how could people believe that? It's beyond me. Uh, he was, uh, words can describe how sadistic he was. And um, he was, um, he enjoyed killing people. When he would shoot somebody, he would stand on his balcony in the morning when people were going to work and coming from a night shift, and he would just shoot. He walked into a barrack that was being painted, and he just shot my, one of my uncles who was working there with one of his sons on his side and his father on the other side. They were by working. He was shot. I'm going to laugh to walk behind the people who were working and shooting them. Can you describe a typical day in the camp, what other kind of work you did? Well, the, sh the workshops from the ghetto were transported to uh, Plashov. So I was still working in the printing shop. 
Uh, the barracks are beyond the description because uh, we didn't have bunk beds, we had like shelves. Uh, we didn't have enough food. We worked very hard. We, every morning and every night we, were, uh, we would stand up for roll call. And uh, at that time, Amon Gerd would, uh, you know, walk between the mass of people. And uh, if he didn't like somebody, he would either shoot them. Every morning and every night, we were exposed to hanging, shooting, beating innocent people for no reason. And he was, uh, he was worse than an animal. It definitely took my face away when I saw innocent people being killed, especially when the little children were taken away. Because you see, again, when we were leaving the ghetto, anybody under 12, anybody over 50 had to remain behind. And the children, especially, we were told that the children would be taken. We left them in the orphan's home, and there were a lot of children because a lot of the Jewish children were brought into the ghetto when their parents were already sent away to be murdered, which at that time we didn't know, we didn't realize. And um, when I, some of the little children were um, smuggled into the camp, and um, some people were lucky enough to be able to smuggle those children to their Polish friends, those we call the righteous Gentiles. We must never forget those righteous Gentiles who risked their lives to save a Jewish child because they were in danger, not just of the Germans, but of their neighbors. Because if a neighbor suspected them of hiding, helping a Jewish family or a Jewish child, they would report them to the Gestapo. For a, for a bag of potatoes. And so there was nobody you could trust. And the only person, of course, that we could trust when we got to know him was Oskar Schindler. Before we get into Oskar Schindler, I have one quick question. What was the most frightening thing about this experience before you met Oskar Schindler? Oh, that would, this is very very hard to describe. Everything was frightening. Every mo you were threatened with death every moment. And if you were still standing, you saw people around you being killed. So you just never knew uh, when, would, when it would be your turn. So getting into Oscar Schindler, how did you get first come into contact with him and working for him? Well, Oskar Schindler, of course, everybody knows uh, that he was born in, uh, he, he was a German, born in Czechoslovakia, and he actually was one of the first to join the Nazi party. He was very ambitious, and he was very greedy for money. So he made contacts with the generals and politicians, and uh, he came to Krakow because he loved the city, he knew the city. Before the war, he was a, a salesman for of farm equipment. And so he came to Krakow, he was able to obtain a factory called Amalia. And with the help of his so-called friends, the generals uh, and the politicians, they bri he, he bribed them. He entertained them, he bought them gifts that they couldn't buy because he was buying it in a black market. He gambled with them and he always lost. He drank with them, but he never got drunk. They, always, all, they were all drunk, but not Oscar. And Oscar Schindler, his goal was to become rich and able to buy expensive cars and expensive horses. And the people that were working for him in his factory, making the pots and pans at that time, they became his workers. He didn't look at the, his workers as animals, cockroaches. They were his workers. They were the people that would make him rich. 
and Oscar Schindler was not going to stand by and do nothing. So, um, you see, you don't have to be very special and have all kinds of uh, wonderful things about you. You just need to say one thing. To not, you have to, you cannot stand by and do nothing when you see that something is wrong. And that's what Oscar Schindler had proven to the world. Everybody said, I didn't know. That's not true. Everybody knew. Concentration camps were right half a mile outside of a village of the city. The smell alone of these old workers walking back and forth. There is no way ever that people didn't know. So how old were you when the war started and how old were you when, Sch when you started working for Schindler? I was 10 when the war started and I was probably 13 when I started to work for Oscar Schindler. And that was a miracle because B B Oscar Schindler had this, became a very good friend of Amon Get because he needed him. So he decided that uh, he didn't want his workers spend the time walking back and forth between Plasho and the factory. So he got a permission to build a camp next to the factory. And when he got the fa uh, permission, he had a request by that time, he had created another factory for making ammunition. So he was doubly needed. He became needed for the war efforts and making the pots and pans for, the, um, for his homeland. How did you view your personal relationship with Oscar Schindler? Did you meet him at all? Oh, I saw him every day. He came to the factory every day, always with a smile on his face, always uh, talking to people, and uh, making sh always making sure that uh, the camp to which we were lucky enough to, to be sent to, leaving Plashov and going to work for Oscar Schindler, was the, that was what saved us. Because Oscar Schindler was very good to his workers. And I was working on a machine called Lace. I was making shells for ammunition. At one time they took me off that machine because I was doing such a good job, I was so fast. The huge machine, which is in the movie, uh, broke, was always breaking. The foreman said I committed sabotage, and he was going to call the guard. And somebody called Oscar Schindler, and I will never forget, he walked down from his office. I saw him through the window, and he said, what's going on? And the foreman said, I broke the machine. And Oscar Schindler said, impossible. A little kid like that cannot break a big machine like that. She's not supposed to work on such a big machine. And only men were allowed to go work on that machine from then on, not women. I think I was the first one okay. and the last one. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, every time he came into the, you know, when he came into the uh, factory, he would pat my head, he would say, we get this kleine. He was, you know, he loved the children. Did you ever meet his wife? Yes. She did not come to, she was, did not come to Krakow with him. But when we went to um, Brenitz, she came and she took care of us. She was wonderful. She was a beautiful lady and he didn't deserve her. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of, now these are some questions about the conditions working under Oscar Schindler. Uh, what kind of food did you eat? What did you Well, Oscar Schindler made sure that we were not starving. So we were given bread that didn't taste like it was made from sodas. We were given coffee that actually tasted like, you know, uh, instant coffee, not sodas. Uh, we were given s potatoes with our soup and meat. Once in a while we got some margarine. I think once in a while we got an egg. Uh, we knew that Oscar Schindler cared. We were not starving under Oscar Schindler. And he did everything he could to save us. When the war was coming to an end, 
when the, when the Germans were losing the war against the Allies, and they were determined to, you know, win the war was against the Jews. That's when Oskar Schindler made his famous deal with Amon Gerd. And he was going to move his factory to Czechoslovakia, to Brinitz, where he came from, and take his workers with him. Did you, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the women on his list, all the women working for Oskar Schindler, were tattooed by the Jewish doctors. So we were tattooed with KEL, which stands for concentration lager. And that didn't last very long. The Jewish doctors had never done that before, so they didn't know what they were doing. Unlike those in the camps like uh, Gross Grossen and Auschwitz, of course, those people tattooed over there, they go to their grave with the number on their arm. And I'm sure there is a special place for, in heaven for them. But uh, Oskar Schindler did everything he possibly could. Uh, when we were loaded onto the trains, we expected to go to Brinitz. Did your family go with you? And um, I went with the 300 women were sent to, supposedly to Brinitz. 150 women loaded into a boxcar. It was a nightmare. There was no water, no, there was no air, and there was no food, and there was no bathroom facilities, and people, women were fainting. And then when the train stopped after what seemed like eternity, and the doors opened, and we looked up, and it was, the spotlight was shining on our train. And I remember looking out, and I saw miles and miles of barbed wire. I saw like hundreds of uh, soldiers, with, always with the dogs. All the soldiers, all the Nazis, they had huge dogs that were trained to tear pe people apart. They were always barking, the soldiers were always heavily armed against people who had no, no arms and no way to, uh, you know, save themselves. And uh, I saw the sign, Auschwitz-Birkenau. And then we knew. We heard rumors about Auschwitz-Birkenau. People were talking about it. But who, how could you believe it? We didn't believe it because it was impossible to imagine. It's still impossible to to know what had happened, how it happened. That supposedly normal cultured people, human beings, are going to build special machines, special equipment to burn people, to gas people, and, and burn their bodies. How is that possible? How could this have happened? How could the world have stood by and done nothing? And say we didn't know, because they knew. And they certainly knew. Maybe, you know, people, so the governments knew. The train, the planes that flew over Auschwitz, um, they knew. They had pictures. They knew what was happening. But nobody cared. And I remember, you know, Auschwitz was a big place because Auschwitz I was where the Polish army used to be housed before the war. And that's where the Germans kept their political prisoners, um, their religious prisoners, prisoners of war. But they built Auschwitz-Birkenau for this only goal to kill as many Jews as they could. There were some people that were not Jews, but all the vic Jews were the victims. And um, it is hard to describe, how to imagine what Auschwitz was like. We were told to run. We were aware of a terrible stench. We, it was late October, beginning of November, I think, already. And um, we were very thirsty, and we thought it was snowing. So we tried to catch some of the snowflakes, and we realized those were no snowflakes, those were ashes. 
we were uh, we were beaten. The, so the soldiers all had whips, and we were running, and we sp came to a halt in front of a barrack, and there was a lot of uh, very well fed and very well dressed Nazi officers. And one of them especially had a whip, and he was sending some woman right, left, right, left. And we saw the woman going to the left, could barely walk. So we just tried to straighten up and um, pinch our cheeks, and were sent to the right. We were told to strip from head to bottom. They shaved our hair from top to bottom. And they were telling us not to cry because we were not going to be, we're not going to the guest, we're going to the shower. Of course, we didn't believe it. By that time, how could you believe anyone? And we were sent to the room that was dark, and the water came in. And I looked at my mom and I didn't recognize her. Because when they shaved our hair, we were so totally, at least I was, so totally, I, I felt so dehumanized. And that I just felt it wasn't me anymore. Okay. And we were very lucky because we were on Oscar, because Oscar Schindler sent somebody to Auschwitz with a fortune of diamonds to buy his women out to send them back. To, to his factory in, uh, in Brinitz, in Czechoslovakia. And that we were the only transport, the 300 women on Schindler's List were the only transport ever to leave Auschwitz to live and not to be murdered someplace else. Auschwitz, how long? Three and a half weeks. And by that time we were ready to be sent to the gas chambers. So. They didn't want to let us go. They kept telling Oscar Schindler, the, the women, they are old, work, they are old. We'll send you fresh ones. And uh, Oscar Schindler said, those are trained workers, and I want them. So if, if you saw the movie, everything in that movie is true. Well, it was the feeling of relief, of gratitude of unbelieving that, that, that we were actually rescued from Auschwitz. And if it was not for Oskar Schindler, I wouldn't be here. I survived with my mom and I survived with my grandfather, who was 75 years old at that time, probably the oldest man ever to survive those camps. And Oskar Schindler, after the war, was considered a um, traitor by Germany. And the United States wouldn't give him a visa to come and live in the United States because he was a, a member of the Nazi party. Mm. And they have taken hundreds of Nazis to help them with the um, atomic bomb and to, as spies against the Russia. All those Nazis who were killing were allowed to come in. Oskar Schindler, who saved us, was not. Oskar has to leave to... Uh, Oskar had to leave because we were going to be um, liberated by Russian. And the Russians would have shot him because he was a member of the Nazi party. He was a manufacturer of ammunition. He was a capitalist and he was owner of slaves. The fact that he, the slaves were saved because he took us wouldn't have mattered to the Russian. Was it sad to see him leave? It was scary to see him leave because we were afraid of who will take care of us. But we were actually, our young men were, uh, were armed and uh, uniformed by the Czech underground. Some of the young men went with Oscar and Emily Schindler to Austria, to Linz, where the Americans were. The rest remained in the camps to make sure that the retreating Germans won't kill us. And as a matter of fact, a truck stopped was loaded with German, and they wanted to know what is this, looking at the camp. And they told him there were people that had uh, diphtheria and typhus. 
So they also didn't want to go near us, of course. They asked for some um, gas, and they gave him some gas, they, and they left. They were in a hurry. The Russians were hours be behind them. How, were the, how did the liberators treat you? So how did the... The liberators treated us very nicely. But uh, the, the Russians told us, don't go to Krakow, they don't want you there. And of course, we all wanted to go to Krakow. That's where we came from, most of us. And when we came to Krakow, we found that um, most of us were orphans. I was half orphan. My father was killed. My mother's, every single one of her siblings and her parents were killed. My father's six brothers, my aunts, my uncles, my little cousins, some of the friends I had from school, everybody we knew was dead. And if it was not for Oskar Schindler, we would have been dead too. And this is my, um, and the reason that I keep talking about it is because I feel that we have to, that I'm eyewitness to some of the most horrible things that happened and are happening again. And uh, as an eyewitness, I feel like I have to pass the torch of memory to the younger generation because we don't live in them a very good wo a world. And it is up to them. It is up to us to teach them, to make them understand that they have the power to make a difference. They don't have to stand by and do nothing. It is absolutely impossible to do that. You cannot be a bystander. You have to be an upstander. And that goes for bullying, because a bully is a coward. A bully will never attack anybody who is weaker. And when you see a bully doing something that you know is wrong, you got, they got to go and get help. I certainly would want a kid to go and try to pick up a fight with a bully who is bigger and fatter. And, and also make the kids realize they have the power to make a difference. And they have the power. They're going to be future voters. And even now, they can write letters to the president. Well, I don't know, the president only tweets, but <laughs> they can write letters to the president, to the congressman. They can write letters to everyone. Well, none of us, none of the Jews wanted to go back to Poland or, or Russia or wherever they came from. They didn't want us. They still hated us, and they still were killing us. So the only place for us was to go someplace where we could get help. And the Americans and the British, but especially the Americans, with the Jewish help of Jewish agencies, created and supported the displaced person camps. And uh, we waited to get a visa to immigrate. There was no Israel. People who tried to uh, smuggle themselves into Israel most of them were caught and sent to another concentration camp in Cyprus. Nobody wanted us. It was fine when the t there was no Jewish quota. There was a quota for Polish people. There was no separate quota for the Jewish people. There were very few. Nobody wanted us. It was when Truman, President Truman, became a president. It was change. And actually, Oskar Schindler worked with the Americans for two years in Germany, trying to find the Nazis. And when the Americans uh, were leaving, Oskar and Emily Schindler uh, moved to Argentina. They were given, a, um, I think, mink farm. And Oskar Schindler imagined himself sitting on the balcony and drinking his whiskey and smoking a cigar and watching the people work. But it wasn't like that. They were supposed to work. Mrs. Schindler worked. And Oskar Schindler came back to Germany to fight for his pension. They didn't want to give it to him. They treated him terrible. Who treated him well were his 
you see, called, called us all his children. And he started to travel to Israel because most of the people I knew went to Israel. And um, there were 4,000 people waiting for him when he came the first time to Israel. Then he, got the, he was the first one to be honored in Yad Vashem, planted the first tree. And he traveled all over the world to meet what he called his children. And we all supported him, especially those who made the, started with nothing and became rich. And um, he used to come and visit. But he lived in Germany and he couldn't find whatever factory he opened with the help of the Jewish people. Uh, it went bankrupt because they didn't, the Germans didn't want to have anything to do with him. He was attacked in Hamburg on a street, and when they went to court, the court told him he was guilty. Sorry. I want to say also that if it wasn't for Steven Spielberg making the movie Schindler's List, the world would not have known about Oscar Schindler, about what he did, because nobody would have gone to see a movie about the Holocaust. There were many movies about the Holocaust before Oscar Schindler, but it was only seen by the Holocaust survivors or maybe some Jewish people. And it was shown in certain theaters at a certain time. But everybody wanted to see what Steven Spielberg did. So that the movie sort of broke the wall of silence, not just for the survivors, but for the liberators. All of a sudden it was like, okay, it was legal to say, I, I am a survivor. And it was legal to say, for the liberator to say, I was there, I liberated a camp, a Buchadwald or, or, or a Mauthausen. Before that, People didn't want to talk because nobody wanted to listen. And what Steven Spielberg did, that was every penny he made on that movie, he created a Shoah Foundation. And he took uh, testimony from over 52,000 people and translated into 31 languages. They are now uh, in Rwanda and Somalia and Darfur. And, um, and Steven Spielberg, I have a letter from him in which he said that a Nobel Prize would not mean as much to him as the fact that 52,000 people said yes when he asked for their testimony. Well, let me put it that way. Those who murdered my family and everybody else, I will not forgive them. Forgiveness is not mine to give. They have to ask forgiveness for the people he murder, they murdered and burned. But I do not keep the younger generation responsible for the crimes of their parents or grandparents. And Germany actually is one uh, supporter of Israel. And in Germany, it's illegal to say Holocaust didn't happen. And there is a lot of Germans who are trying, uh, and some of, ch some of the children or grandchildren of Nazis, who are uh, trying to lead uh, groups to Auschwitz and talk about the Holocaust. And of course, there are still some that hate the Jews. That will never end. Uh, and one, one other important thing that I like the kids to know is something that uh, John F. Kennedy had said at his inauguration address. That was whether you are black or white or yellow or whatever religion you are, when you cut your finger, your blood is red. You cannot look at a person and say, because of his color or religion, I don't want anything to do with them. We are all alike, and we have to learn how to treat people with, with kindness and respect.
Well, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful for Oscar Schindler because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. And I don't want the world to forget him. Because I think forgetting is dangerous. I think even now you come across people who are still denying Holocaust and we cannot allow this to happen because it's still happening. I'm not that optimistic. In one way, I am optimistic for the um, future of my great-grandchildren. I am not optimistic, certainly, for my generation and even for my children's generation. And I'm worried about the future of my grandchildren because I see the same thing happening now that was happening in 1936 in 1937. That's when Hitler started to come into power. That's when Hitler started to tell the judges what to say, when he told the doctors not to treat Jewish people, or when he told people not to go to Jewish doctors. And uh, I see it happening again, and I think we cannot allow this to happen. And that's the liberators and the survivors are disappearing at a very fast rate. Um, so really, the future belongs to the younger people. Is there a message, uh, like a final message you would like to leave with our, our students? Well, I want the students to be the eyewitnesses because we want them not to forget and not to let the world forget what hate can do. You have to look at other people the way you want to be treated. You see a kid, if you see a new student comes into school, be the first one that goes over and say hi. Because can you imagine what a child feels when they are transferred to a new school, walks into a school, you must be petrified. And if you're going to go over and say hi and introduce him maybe to him or her to some of your friends, make feel some, make, it will make you feel good. People who, are, who hate, they are not happy people. People who have a little kindness in them, they can do, there is, there is no, you know, no end to what they can do with kindness.